In previous videos, we began to start to see why the financial system is so important, okay? And what we're going to be doing today is thinking again about the financial system, why it matters, and start to see the connection between money and banking. Money and banking are really tightly connected. They're basically the same thing in a way. And that's what we're going to get a taste of in these videos. But before we do that, let's think about why the financial system is important. The value of the financial system. And I'm doing this early on in the semester because I, I want you guys to understand why you care about this class. This is meant to be motivation for understanding why these things matter. Because frankly, a lot of this stuff is not personally important. The material we're learning here is not some way for you to invest and become wealthy. No, but rather it's about understanding how the economy works as a whole. This is an upper level class. It's about learning how the financial system works. So if you get through this class and you've really taken in what's been taught, I think you'll understand how the economy works much more than somebody who hasn't taken this course. So in no particular order here, we'll start with what we've seen in the past and then get to the newer material. Um, what we saw from the last class is when the financial system works well, the government can be less involved. which is certainly a valuable thing. Anytime the government can get out of the way, that's generally going to be a good thing. The reason is, is the government doesn't have to deal with competition the way individual businesses do. Generally speaking, businesses are going to do a better job of producing products, managing capital, things like that, than the government would. Because if businesses do a poor job, they fail, right? So you're left with businesses that are all very capable. Whereas if the government struggles or fails, it can still continue to produce a product or good. So why is this the case? Why is this true? Well, think back to what we saw with classical versus Keynesian economics, okay? If everyone who saves their money sees that money go into the economy, right? When you save your money, if the banks loan it out, then when people choose to save, that money is all lent out and spent, right? So when financial markets are working really well, that means when people choose to save their money, Pretty much all of it is spent. Why does this matter? Well, people will randomly and somewhat haphazardly transition from spending more money to saving more, more money based on their own expectations about the economy, personal need, etc. So for example, if right now people get really pessimistic about the economy, the immediate response is going to be to save more of their money. If the classical economic system works, all of that money will be borrowed and spent. So the economy will do just fine. Compare that to the Keynesian economy. If the Keynesian economy works and Say's law fails, then when people start saving more money, that money will get stuck in the bank in their reserve system and it won't all get loaned out and spent. So the economy is destined to go through a period of economic turmoil when people start saving more money. Okay? So the better the financial system is working, the more likely that money gets saved and then eventually spent, the less the government needs to come in to fix these problems. All right? To give you an extreme example, if people stop trusting the bank and they start keeping their money at home, well, then the financial system is screwed, right? If you go from spending $1,000 to saving $1,000 and you keep all $1,000 at your house, that money does nothing. That can be really bad for the economy. So the government's going to have to come in and try to fix these issues when the economy is struggling. The better the financial system is, the smaller the role of government can be. What else does the financial system do? course, it facilitates borrowing. Obviously, it does that, but think about what people borrow money for. It's really all the most important things in the economy. The number one reason money is borrowed in the United States is to start businesses. That's the majority of, of the reason why money is borrowed. So businesses beginning is really a, you know, a key of an economy. If we think about the United States and you think about all those big businesses out there, they all started by borrowing money. Okay, so the better financial system is, the more of these banks can borrow money. Buying houses, attending college, and we could go on and on. The bottom line is, when people borrow money, 
They do it for really important reasons. A lot of the most important things that happen in the economy come from the financial sector. So if the financial sector is struggling, that's gonna be a big problem. If we think about this at even a more abstract level, think about what borrowing does. When you're saving money, think about what that means. When I put money in the bank, what I'm really saying is I don't need it, right? When you put money into a bank, you're saying, I don't need it. And then what banks do is they give it to somebody who needs it really badly. That's really what's happening is move, money moves to the people who need it the most. So money finds its most important use without anyone telling the system to operate, without anyone planning for it to work this way. This is ultimately what the financial system does. Not perfectly, but imperfectly, okay? Um, so if I put money in the bank, think about who is going to borrow it. Who borrows the money? The people who are willing to pay the highest interest rate, all right? Now, why would somebody be willing to pay a high interest rate? Because they need the money badly, all right? So when you have a financial system, what that does is it takes money from people who don't need it now and gives it to people who need it now, which is really valuable to the economic system as a whole, all right? Within that, it allows you the ability to retire and save money. Without the financial system, our money would gain 0% interest. We'd hold it at our house, right? And it would gain 0% interest. In fact, if there's inflation, it would lose value over time. But by using financial markets, like banks, stock market, bond markets, we're able to build wealth over time, which enables us to work today and not work in the future. Without financial markets, it'd be really hard to retire because you would need to be building your wealth all the time in order to keep your head above water, okay? And one more thing on this list that we're going to see um, today is it allows us to create more money. Banks create money. So beyond just the financial system existing, when, when I say financial system, I'm really meaning the saving and borrowing industry. Beyond the Federal Reserve creating money, beyond a central bank creating money, the banks and the financial system create money as well, okay? Through an organic system that we've uh, basically established in the United States and pretty much all developed countries. So without the financial system, I, I think the economy would never be where it is. It, it, when people, you know, if I think about what the most important invention of all time is for humans, it, it's gotta be the financial system, money and the financial system. All, all the wealth that gets generated through the financial system is really amazing. Um, if people were unable to borrow money, you would end up in a society where there's very little ingenuity, very little technology. It would be very hard for lower income people to move up through the ranks because people generally need to borrow when they don't have much money. It gives them that ability to uh, assess funds. So the financial system is really important and it's very complicated at some times as well, okay? So we're going to go through some of the complex issues in this class to think about how this fragile and important system in financial markets is maintained by the Federal Reserve and the federal government. So let's move on. Let's connect money and banking. Let's think about why money and banking are connected. Now, obviously, they're connected, right? When you take money to a bank, you know, you can save it there. They're obviously connected. But the thing to recognize is that money and banking are actually the same system, okay? When you think money, think banks. They are connected, all right? It's going to be pretty clear of why that's the case once we roll through this example here. So let's start. Let's imagine that there's a monetary base in our economy of $1 million, okay? A monetary base of $1 million. And let's think about how the banks would deal with that money. Let's deal with the United States first, okay? In the United States, in normal times, we have something called a required reserve rate. This is something I suspect you've heard of before from other economics courses, but perhaps not. 
The required reserve rate is the percent of deposits that a bank has to hold in its reserves. And in normal economic times, we have a strict rule in the United States on this, okay? So we're thinking in dollar terms, if there's a certain amount of money deposited into a bank, a bank has to hold a chunk of that. That's called the required reserve rate. In the United States, the required reserve rate in typical times is 10%, all right? So that means if I take $1,000 to a bank, bank can hold $100 or more, and it can loan up to $900. Generally speaking, banks are gonna loan out as much as they possibly can because that's how they generate their profits is through loans. So this basically puts a bit of a stranglehold on how much money they can loan out. That's the bad thing. The good thing is, is it increases the odds that banks will never run out of money. Since they're holding a chunk of money at any given moment, it's unlikely that they're going to experience a bank run where people withdraw all their money at the same time. This is one of those financial tricks that we've learned to implement in the United States to avoid financial catastrophes. So let's think about how this would work. If we have a required reserve rate of 10%, think about what would happen over time. Pretty much all money in the economy ends up channeling through banks. This is actually growing in terms of uh, its relevance in the United States. Um, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, there's money sitting around, you know, sitting around in people's houses and stuff. There's not a whole lot of that anymore. Money tends to go through banks. If you have a paycheck, I bet there's a good chance your paycheck is actually direct deposited into your account. You never even hold it. There's a good chance when you buy stuff, you use a check, checking or debit card to, to make purchases. Uh, if you're using a debit card to make purchases, again, you're never really holding the money. Money just kind of seems to move from bank to bank. We never physically use it very often anymore, right? When we use real money, we're usually just using it for small purchases. Big purchases, credit cards, debit cards, checks, things like that. So what that means is if there's a million dollars of cash, a million dollars in a monetary base, almost all of that money is going to end up in banks. And so what you'll have is deposits of the full amount of one million bucks. So if the Federal Reserve in the United States creates a million dollars, pretty much all one million dollars is going to end up in a bank. Now, what's the bank going to do with those deposits? They're going to loan out probably the most they're allowed to loan out. Typically, that would be 90 percent. All right. So of that one million dollars, they're going to hold the minimum of one hundred thousand dollars and then they're going to loan out the rest. And this is where we're going to start seeing a multiplier effect. Think about where this economy is right now, all right? All of you, I'm sure, have checking accounts. So if you have checking accounts, do you consider that your money? If you have $1,000 in a checking account, whose money is that? Well, it's yours, right? If you have $1,000 in a checking account, it's your money. You can spend that money anytime you want. You can go to an ATM, you can draw it. You can spend it using a, a debit card. However, where is that money? Where is your $1,000 that you think you have at the bank? Well, it's being loaned out. Probably $900 of that is being loaned out. So here's the amazing thing that banks do. They allow multiple people to use the same money at the same time. Let me say that again. Banks create a system where more than one person can use a dollar bill at the same time. Okay, I know that sounds a little weird, but it's 100% accurate. The money that you have in your bank account right now, even if you aren't physically spending it, you are using it in a way. If your $1,000 disappeared from your bank account, it would change your behavior, right? So that $1,000, even if you're not constantly or consciously spending it right now, it is affecting your behavior. I've got 50 bucks in my wallet right now. Since I know I have $1,000 in the bank, well then fine, I'll spend the 50 because I know I've got plenty of money behind it. The fact that I know I can access that money if I need to causes me to spend more of the money that I have. 
So it's like I get to use that money at any moment. Furthermore, like I said before, you can always withdraw it. You can always literally access it. So you think that money is yours. But at the same time, your money's loaned out to fund houses or new businesses, right? So your money can be used by multiple people at the same time. Okay, now think about this now. There's a, a million dollars held in the bank, but now there's $900,000 to spend loaned out. People who deposited that money in the bank still think it's theirs, but someone else is using it. So the thing is, the bank has actually created more money. There's $1 million in cash, but this $900,000 also begins to act like money too. So now there's $1.9 million in money, okay? It doesn't stop there either. This $900,000 is also going to end up back in the banks, all right? So if we imagine a second bank here, maybe all of that $900,000 goes into a second bank. That second bank is going to hold 10% of that money and they're gonna end up making loans as well. Right? All right, in case you're missing the math there, they have to hold 10% of that $900,000 so they can loan out 810,000. Let's step all the way back to the beginning. There's a million dollars in cash. It goes into banks. Banks loan out $900,000. Although that $900,000 came from the bank, the people who deposited it still feel like it's their money. They're still going through life as if it's their money. But other people are using it too. So now we've got $1.9 million in money, even though there's not $1.9 million in cash. The $900,000 goes back into a different bank. 90% gets loaned out. We've now got $2.71 million in money, despite the fact that we only have $1 million in cash. This is called the money multiplier effect. The money multiplier effect, okay? And this is not some abstract idea that uh, some people agree with or disagree. No, this is how it works, all right? This is how our monetary system works, okay? The banks create most of the money through loans. So when you think about how much money there is in society, you need to recognize that it's banks that are creating that money, not the Federal Reserve. So just regular old commercial banks create most of the money. This is where you start realizing that, that, that banking and everything is, is a bit complicated, all right? It's, it's all very abstract. You can spend a lot of time thinking about banks and your head will explode a little bit. Um, you know, you know if, if I ask you right now, how much money do you have? Think about, answer that question in your head. How much money do you have? What you'd recognize is the money that you have is all sort of imaginary in a way, right? You might think, well, I've got $2,000 in checking, 500 bucks in stocks, $1,000 in a savings account. None of that is actually money, right? The money that you have in a checking account is gone. It's been loaned out. The money you have in a savings account is gone. It's been loaned out. The money you have in stocks isn't money at all. It's ownership in a company. So we have to figure out a way to define money in a way that is aside from just counting the cash because people don't really hold much cash in reality. So let's get back to the money multiplier. The money multiplier is a mathematical calculation. It's very simple. It's one divided by the required reserve rate. And what it does is it shows us the maximum amount of money that can be created from one initial dollar. All right? When the Fed or any central bank puts one unit of currency into society, it doesn't stop there. Every dollar that goes into society multiplies. This is the money multiplier effect. It happens in the banks because when banks make loans, it allows multiple people to use money at the same time. I take a dollar in, let's just say they loan the whole thing out. I take a dollar to a bank, they loan out a dollar, now two people are using it at the same time. That's the money multiplier effect. Mathematically, we solve it as one divided by R. So that means if the required reserve rate is 10%, 
then the money multiplier will be 10. Every initial dollar created in the United States has the ability to be worth $10 in money, okay? Every $1 of cash can become $10 in money, okay? If the required reserve rate goes down, the money multiplier goes up. If banks are able to loan out more of their money, we'll end up with more money in society. Because of this monetary system, the way we create money, we're going to have to figure out a way to measure how much money is in society. If we just count cash, we won't get a very good answer. So what we're going to do next is figure out how do we even define money and how do we count how much of, of it there is in society. Once you start to get your head around the way money works, you realize that there's a bit of a problem in terms of figuring out how much money there is. Um, how do we define money? How do we choose what is money? What counts? Well, it turns out we've got a couple of different ways to count it in the United States. Um, and it's based largely on liquidity. And you'll see the liquidity defined in a couple of different ways. Um, how easy it is to spend, right? So if we think about money, how easy it is to spend that money. Now, when you think about something like stocks, stocks can't really be sold, but they can be converted and then spent, right? They can be converted into more liquid assets. So you'll see this definition sometimes. Um, another way to think about it is how easy is it to convert cash? So it's kind of two separate definitions. Um, if you think of stuff that's very easy to spend, that's stuff that generally is pretty liquid. And then when you start thinking about things that are less easy to spend, like a house, a house really can't be spent, right? But it can be converted into cash. Not very liquid, it takes a while. So liquidity is often used to think about if something is very clearly money or if something is quasi money, okay? So we might think about a scale of pure money, to not being money at all. And what you realize is there's very few things that fall on either side of the spectrum. Pretty much everything is a bit of a gray area, okay? So let, let's think about something that is extremely liquid, cash. Even within the component of cash, some dollar bills have different levels of liquidity, right? Like, like a, a $20 bill is extremely liquid. We might put all the way to the right-hand side of this chart. Whereas a $100 bill is far less liquid, right? I'm sure you've run into the issue before where you've had a $100 bill and it's tougher to spend, right? If you're gonna go to the bar and you're gonna buy a beer, they're probably not gonna accept your $100 bill, right? So it is far less liquid. A quarter is more liquid than a penny. Pennies can't be used at parking meters and vending machines. So liquidity is a scale. There are some things that are very clearly money, like a $20 bill. And then even within the category of cash, some things aren't quite as liquid. So, so what is the most liquid? Well, we actually have a way of thinking about this um, in a more direct sense. We have a way that we've categorized it so that we all can be on the same playing field when it comes to thinking about how much money exists in society. So thinking about liquidity, thinking about if things are clearly money. There are three categories that we like to put things in. There's pure currency, okay? So this is cash and coins. And we might think of that as being our base for money, okay? The amount of cash and coins in society is not all of our money, but it is the starting point. It's where money originates from. So if you have money in a checking account, that money in a checking account isn't really cash and coins, right? If you have $5,000 in a checking account, that doesn't really mean there's $5,000 in the bank, in cash, waiting for you to use. But to get that $5,000 in the bank, there's a good chance you started with some currency to begin that process, okay? So currency is our starting point, and then we're going to become more and more broad. All right. So currency being one way to think about how much money is in society. A second way is M1. This is something all of you should have seen before in prior classes. 
M1 is a very liquid measure. It includes stuff that is most obviously money, okay? So the stuff that we consider to be the most obviously money in the United States is currency, right? Cash and coins, checking accounts, which are extremely liquid nowadays. You know, 20 years ago, you would, you would argue that currency is the most liquid thing. You could make the argument now that checking accounts are actually more liquid, right? Uh, if you have $20 in your pocket, that's in some ways harder to spend than $20 in a checking account because you can use your checking account to purchase stuff online. You can use your checking account to pay off credit card de uh, debt very easily. So this is actually incredibly liquid, okay? And then the third on this category is traveler's checks, which I'm not even going to talk about, but I'm going to list it here because it is included. These things aren't very important anymore, okay? But they are technically in M1. So this is the stuff that is extremely liquid, all right? This is the stuff that is clearly money. The next category is M2. So M2 is a broader measure of the money supply. So it includes things that aren't as liquid, okay? So when we think about how much money we have, if I ask you how much money you have, I bet, without a doubt, you would consider your currency and checking accounts and traveler's checks if you had any, okay? Some of the stuff in M2 might be a little more debatable over whether it is money or not, all right? First of all, M2 has everything in M1, okay? So M2 is a comprehensive list of things that we would consider clearly money, all right? So it's got all of M1, and then it's got stuff that's a little bit closer to not being money, like savings accounts, okay? Savings accounts and checking accounts are actually a little different in terms of how easily you can spend them. Checking accounts, extremely easy, right? You can withdraw from the ATM. You can use it you know, with your, your debit card. It's very easy to spend that money. Savings accounts are tougher to spend. If you have money in a savings account, you usually can't withdraw it directly from the ATM. You usually can't directly make purchases with your debit card using a savings account. Instead, if you want to spend this money, you've got to transfer it over into checking first. And sometimes there's a limit about how much or how frequently you can transfer that money over. So these are less liquid because they're harder to spend. But I bet we would all agree that we would consider it money, right? Personally, we would consider this money. But from a macroeconomic standpoint, if people have money in savings account, that money is less likely to get spent quickly, right? If we think about how much money is going to be spent today, we probably wouldn't include savings account in that discussion, but we certainly would think about people spending money in their checking accounts, right? That's the difference in terms of liquidity. Checking accounts are more clearly money than savings accounts are, okay? So in this category, we've got M1, we've got savings accounts, we've got CDs, certificates of deposits. We might talk more about these in the future, but they're pretty simple. CDs work like this. You take money to a bank, maybe $500, and you buy a three-month CD. Three months from now, you will get paid out your $500 plus interest, okay? It's less liquid because there's a time you have to wait before your money becomes available to you. What makes these money is usually you can opt out of them once you have them, all right? So if you have money in a CD, you usually can kind of cancel your CD and get some of that money out. So it is harder to withdraw money from a CD than a savings account but we still categorize this in M2. And then the final uh, thing to include in M2 is money market mutual funds. And again, we may talk more about these in the future. These are actually a big deal. There's a lot of money in market, money market mutual funds. Money market mutual funds are basically very safe investments that you can withdraw your money from extremely quickly, okay? So let's say that you put $1,000 in a Robinhood account, right? I'm sure you're all familiar with Robinhood. If you put $1,000 into a Robinhood account today, but you haven't invested it yet, it will be held in a money market mutual fund, most likely. What that means is the money is invested in stuff that is incredibly safe. Even if you don't realize you have a money market mutual fund, you often do, because businesses don't want to have a bunch of cash sitting there in a liquid state. They would like to put it into something where it can earn a little bit of interest. So when you put your money into... Robinhood or TD Ameritrade or PayPal 
or if you put your money into like an Amazon account or, or an Xbox account, when you put your money there, a lot of times those businesses will move the money into a really safe investment like a money market mutual fund. That way they earn a little bit of interest, but they're still not really facing any risk, okay? So these tend to be extremely liquid as well. So we've got these different ways to think about how much money there is in society. There is no answer to how much money is there. There are multiple answers to it. You see, it depends on how strict you want to be with the definition of money. So let's think about where we stand right now in the United States. So given that we have these criteria of M1 and M2 and currency, it's kind of useful to think about how much money there is in the United States based on those criteria to get a feel for how quickly things can change. All right. So if you wanted to think about how much money is coming in and coming out of the United States, you first need to understand where that money has come from. Okay. Money is creating, created basically in two ways. All right. One way is through the federal reserve. And that's where we're heading when we get into the next bit of content in this class, which is some very interesting but pretty tricky content if you haven't seen it before. So the Federal Reserve can create new money. They can do it in a couple of ways. They can do it directly through currency increases, right? They can put more cash and coins into society. But a lot of times they do it in more sneaky ways, as we'll see um, in the next bit of content. So the Federal Reserve can create money. Who else can create money? Banks, right? We saw that through the money multiplier. So the other entity that can create money is banks. And you will see a significant relationship and interplay between the Federal Reserve and banks as they go out to change the money supply. All right. The thing to recognize is for the Federal Reserve, their decisions about how much money is going to be in society, these are conscious decisions. What I mean by that is when the Federal Reserve does stuff that increases the money supply, they're doing that on purpose. They're doing that for the reason of increasing the money supply. All right. Compare that to banks. Banks, when they change how much money in society, that is not on purpose. Okay. So these are going to be unintentional. So for example, if banks suddenly decide that they want to hold more money at the bank, if they want to hold more money in their reserves, that will decrease the money supply. But they're not doing it to decrease the money supply. They're doing it for some other reason. They're doing it because they want to reduce risk, for example. So although both of these entities can create money, only one does so in an intentional fashion. So they're the ones that are really calling the shots and organizing the monetary system in the U.S., even though they're not the ones creating most of the money. Okay. So let's think about how much money is out there might be interesting for you to think about this before I write it down. If you had to guess, how much currency is there? How much American currency is there in the world? Okay. Most of it's in the U.S., but not all of it. So how much is there in the world? We don't know for sure. Okay. Because some money gets destroyed, it gets lost, that sort of thing. But our best estimate as of January 2021 is about $2 trillion. Okay, so that's how much currency there is. That's cash and coins. Now let's think about M1. Same deal, right? These are generally estimates, but they're probably pretty accurate estimates. So how much M1 do you think there would be? Well, again, as of the time of this recording, January 2021, it looks like there's about $6.6 .6 trillion in M1. Okay, so you got $2 trillion in cash. And then you've got $4.6 trillion in other stuff. Now, do you remember what's in M1? Currency, checking accounts, and traveler's checks, okay? And in fact, checking accounts are what makes up most of the difference here. So when you're thinking about money, this is what you need to realize. There's more money in checking accounts than there is physical currency, okay? There's more money in checking accounts than there is physical currency. That's the money multiplier. That's the banks unintentionally creating money through loans. When you take $1,000 to the bank and they loan it out, two people can use that money. The money comes back into a bank and gets loaned out again. Now three people are using that money. So you end up tripling the money supply in that example as money gets created through loans. Okay? So M1 contains $6.6 .6 trillion. M2, right? 
M2 is all of M1 plus savings accounts, money market mutual funds, and things like CDs, all right? We call those small time deposits, CDs being a good uh, synonym for that. So M2 has got to be larger because it includes all of M1 plus some other stuff. So M2 at the time of writing has about $19.2 trillion, which means that there's a lot of difference here, right? There, there, there's a lot of extra money between M2 and M1. And what's generally driving that is those money market mutual funds that we talked about before. You probably didn't know much about money market mutual funds. Hell, I don't know much about money market mutual funds, but it turns out there's a lot of money in those accounts. Anywhere where your money is saved online, you might be earning the interest through a money market mutual account, or the entity holding the money may be earning it and basically not telling you about it, okay? So it turns out a lot of that money, especially held online, is invested in money market mutual funds, okay? So you can see that counting how much money is out there depends on your starting point. It depends on what you consider money, what your criteria are. Now let's think about the percentage change, okay? So I'm gonna write this in blue. This is the percentage change since last year. Specifically, this is from December 2019 to December 2020, okay? During that one year period, what do you think has happened to the amount of money in society? Do you think it went up or do you think it went down? There's a lot going on, right? What we're really thinking about there is 2020, which of course is the COVID year. Turns out the Federal Reserve was very aggressive. When people aren't spending money much, you tend to need to do things to stimulate the economy through increased monetary policy, through increasing the money supply. Okay. Remember when we talked about Keynes, one way to fix recessionary gaps is for the government to spend money or for the government to cut taxes. Another way to stimulate the economy is for the Federal Reserve to increase the money supply. We're going to talk a lot about that in the future. It's a big part of this class, thinking about what the Federal Reserve does when things are bad in the economy. To give you a little taste of how aggressive the Fed can be, let's think about how these components changed in this year. Over the last 12 months, the amount of currency in society went up by 15.3%. All right, so a 15% increase in how much currency there is in society. The gut reaction when you see that is to think that there probably would be a lot of inflation. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. Okay, so even though there's more money in society, that doesn't necessarily mean that money is losing value. Um, there's actually several things we need to think about to think about what determines inflation. All right, so we have a lot more money than we did before as measured by currency. What about as measured by M1? As measured by M1, we added 67% to the money supply in one year. That's a really big increase, right? A two-thirds increase in how much money is held in the United States, basically. That's measured by M1, okay? So what do you think is driving that, all right? If this is currency and this is M1, how can there be such a big difference? It turns out that checking accounts saw a big increase in holding. So although there isn't a huge increase in how much physical currency there is, there is a huge increase in how much is held in checking accounts. Money doesn't have to physically exist to exist, okay? So that money you have in a checking account, that's increased by quite a good, good deal over the, uh, the past year. What about M2? Turns out M2 only went up by 25.4%, which is interesting when you think about it, right? M2 includes M1. So if M2 is only going up by 25%, the components that M2 includes in addition to M1, so savings accounts, money market mutual funds, there must have been perhaps no change in those accounts or maybe even a negative change. So what we can do and what I like about seeing each of these categories is they tell a story. If you understand what's in M1 and what's in M2, you can really understand what's driving the change in society. So what we're really seeing over the last year is a huge increase in checking account values. And there are various, various reasons why that would be the case, but the overwhelming driving factor is the behavior of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is doing things to put money out there and a lot of it's being funneled into checking accounts instead of other places, okay?
So that's measuring the money supply. This is going to be crucial because when we think about changing how much money is in society, we need to know how much we have to begin with. If the Fed wants to increase the money supply by 10%, we need to know our starting point in order to accomplish it.